I'm Mike Farrington. Welcome back to my shop, a.k.a. The Boardroom. So I thought I'd make a video on my process for making Kumiko. And I just wanted to mention up front that my process combines the use of power tools and hand tools. And this is important because I have such respect for the people who can do this type of work with hand tools only. I hope one day to have the time to be able to develop those skills. But with a young family and not a lot of spare time, I have to find methods to kind of work through these processes a little faster. So this video was designed to be a little bit more of a how-to than just telling a story. So for those of you watching who plan on tackling this, let's get started. So the first step is to make a couple of jigs. I scrounged up a nice piece of eight quarter poplar and a couple of small pieces of four quarter poplar. And I four squared those pieces of lumber. And the exact dimensions are not real super important, just get them nice and square. Over the years, I have collected and used many different saw blades, and I've found a 40 tooth blade to be my favorite all around blade. But if I'm gonna be ripping solid lumber, especially thicker solid lumber, I do like to switch to a 24 tooth rip blade. So when it's all said and done, this piece is gonna be inch and three quarters, inch and seven eighths thick by about two and three quarters inch wide. Next it's time to put a rabbit, or as some call it, a rebate. And I do this by making two cuts on the table saw. The up-down dimension in this shot is about an inch, and the left-right dimension is a half an inch. Somebody call up Lee Nielsen and tell him the handle on my chisel keeps falling out. So when I do these types of cuts on the table saw, I usually leave like a little bit of a ledge. And I come back and I just cut that ledge out with a chisel. So the half inch dimension of this rabbit is driven by the thickness that you're going to make the Kumiko pieces. That measurement could have just as easily been 3 eighths or 5 eighths or 3 quarters. And you'll see a little bit better what I'm talking about later in the video. So now things are becoming a little bit more clear how this jig is going to work. I have created a square U-shape, I guess. On the left side, you have about a one inch height, and on the right side, you have about one quarter of an inch. So now I'm just cutting some chunks off this piece that I've made. I think I cut them at about five inches, six inches, and the last one was probably about eight inches. When making your jigs, I would recommend a length of probably 10 inches. A little bit extra length helps with adjustability. Now it's time to assemble these puppies. Alignment's not super important, but getting the bottom as flat as possible will help with stability. Next we move on to setting the angles for each of the individual jigs. This first angle is 22 and a half degrees. The next angle to cut is 45 degrees. And don't waste your time with too much accuracy on this. I'm just going to the detent on my chop saw and that's good enough. And notice how I double cut this. As the jig gets worn out from use, you can always come back to your chop saw and just clean that face up a little bit. This last angle is 67 and a half degrees. My saw is set to 22 and a half degrees and then I'm using a speed square to kind of make up the rest of that angle. So this is a little bit dangerous. If you're not comfortable cutting this way, you can use double stick tape and your table saw sled, or you could use one of those angle jigs for your rip fence on your table saw. And here's the end result. Now that the body of the jig has been made, it's time to turn our attention to the sliding stop that we're going to put in the channel. This is either a 3 16 or a quarter inch plywood, I don't remember. This is a one quarter inch bit. And I took my time with setup to make sure that it was nice and centered. And the slot length is about two and a half, three inches long. Thought it'd be a good idea to turn on my dust collector for this second one. So here I'm just playing around with where I'm going to locate the screw that's going to hold this sucker in place. 
Coffee break. Ah, just kidding. I keep my paste wax in an old coffee can. The threaded inserts that I'm using are brass, and as you may or may not know, brass is pretty soft. So I do two things. I drill a pretty generous pilot hole, and I use a little bit of wax to help them thread. So here it is, the first shot of the completed angle jig. Next up is a thicknessing sled. The base piece is ripped to six inches wide and the left and right pieces are an inch and five eighths. Time for another rabbit, 1 8 inch by 3 16 inch. These dimensions work good for a Lee Nielsen block plane, but if you're going to be using a different plane, this may take a little bit of experimentation for you. Up until now, I've been pretty lax about being accurate, but in this case, there's no margin for error here. This has to be cut really, really consistently. And it's not so much the dimension that's important, it's that both sides are cut exactly the same. So I left a little ledge on there as a clamping surface. And this jig gets used quite a bit, so I wanted to keep the clamps down and out of the way. I didn't want to be bumping into them. There's a little planing stop. I do not recommend gluing this in. This is something that's going to get beat up and you're going to want to be able to unscrew it and take it out. So with that said, you're going to be planing right by this thing and you definitely want to countersink the screws real good so you don't uh, dent up your hand plane blade. So here's one of the super mega awesome radical features of my particular design on this jig. I oversize the trough area by quite a bit and then I plane out a plug to go in there. And this has two distinct advantages. One, you could have a few different plugs so you could easily plane to different thicknesses. And two, you can shim those plugs by using tape. So the idea here is that you want to lift the plug slowly with tape until the planing thickness that results is exactly the width of one saw kerf. So unless you're lucky or real good, this is going to take a little bit of trial and error. I ended up having to add four pieces of tape to get this plug up to the right height. All right, shifting gears here, we're gonna make the final jig. So pick your favorite saw blade, because you're gonna to need to stick with it through the rest of this project. Cut out a piece of MDF and cut a 1 8 inch high groove in it. So you remember all that work you did with that planing sled? This piece should just slide right into that groove and then glued in place. And while that's drying, is a good time to do a little bit of sharpening on your hand plane. So it seems like sharpening jigs are all the rage these days, and I do understand their merits. And if you don't do a lot of sharpening, I think that they can help, but you can definitely get good results uh, freehand sharpening. I actually own a couple of sharpening jigs, and I never use them because by the time I have them all set up and I'm sharpening, I could have already been done sharpening. So I just sort of took the time to develop some skills to be able to freehand sharpen, and it's served me well.
All right, the glue is dry. It's time to get back to work. All right, so what we're doing here is creating a registration key, and you'll see how that's used in just a moment. All right, once this is done, all the jigs are made. It's time to actually go make a little Kumiko panel. Start by selecting a little chunk of lumber. This is maple, and you can see its riffs on. Fairly straight grain. So you're going to want to plane this down to a half inch thickness so that it fits in the little U shape of the three angle jigs that we made. Make sure your miter gauge is nice and square. And I'm setting the registration pin two inches from the blade. Set your saw blade height for a little bit more than half the thickness of this blank. So here's where you know what gets real. Uh, the first cut's arbitrary. The second cut gets registered to that registration key. And the third cut, and so on. And you can see how pretty easily you could make a gigantic Kumiko panel using this process. So the next step is to rip out the strips that will actually make up the Kumiko pattern. And for this I like a zero clearance insert with a little sort of semi-riving knife built into it. You can actually build this in such a way that that little splitter slash riving knife acts as a feather board and kind of presses the outfeed of the rip up against the rip fence. And when I'm cutting out these strips, I like to oversize them by maybe a 32nd of an inch, maybe a 64th if I'm feeling lucky. And if you're uncomfortable doing this on the table saw, there's no reason why the band saw wouldn't work just perfect to rip these strips. So this is definitely not time to try and take your finest shaving. Set your plane up for a nice heavy cut and just get through this. If you took the time to set your jig up properly, this becomes a very easy process. So I have to be honest, when I'm actually doing Kumiko work, I don't use a hand plane and a planing sled like this. I actually use my wide belt sander. I can make hundreds of parts in the same amount of time. So I mention this because if you have a wide belt sander or a drum sander or a planer, you can definitely take the time to set it up and get these same results in a lot less time. All right, so let's see if all of our hard work has paid off. Let's put this grid work together. And I will say this, if you've made it this far, the rest is easy. So just for your frame of reference, the fitting of these lap joints is pretty tight. I think I would probably want it a little bit looser. Um, it'll take a little bit of experience as you kind of play around with this, but um, you know, you do it a couple of times and you'll realize, nah, that's too tight or no, nah, that's too loose. Just planing up a few more pieces for the infill. So we get started by pulling out all my angle jigs and I rough cut the infill pieces. And always cut a couple of extras, you'll need them for setup. When setting up to cut your first angles, the length is not critical, it just needs to be longer than what the finished piece needs to be. So now you've got one rough cut end and one end that has two 45 degree angles cut on it. And here I'm trying to illustrate that the piece is too long and that's on purpose. So I've just marked it to approximate length. So when cutting the other side, you want to sort of creep up on the final dimension. Cut it, see if it fits, shorten it a little bit more, and so on and so forth. And I don't think I've mentioned it to this point, but if you cut an angle and then flip it over and butt it back up against the stop, it ensures that the point is right in the middle of the piece, which is really important when you're making the parts for the infill. So here I'm just making a tiny little adjustment to shorten the piece up. 
Nailed it! Without using any nails. Ah, uh, woodworking humor. Here are the rest of the info parts rough cut. So for the next pieces, we're going to have to use the 67.5 degree jig and the 22.5 degree jig. In my opinion, the 67.5 degree jig is the hardest one to use because it's not that easy to get a good grip on the piece. So I suggest doing these cuts first. Next, moving on to the 22 and a half degree jig. And again, the pieces were left intentionally long, so we are creeping up on the fit here. So here I'm just pointing out that there's no landing place for the final piece of the pattern. But if we go back to the 22 and a half degree jig, flip the piece over and shorten the stop just a few thousandths of an inch, it will create a pocket that that final key piece can fit into. So here you can see the pocket that's created by making that second bevel at the 22 and a half degree jig. And I try and make those cuts so that the two pieces that are touching now, it's about one third of the thickness. And then when you put the key in, that's two thirds of the thickness. Back to the 45 degree jig for the final piece. So take your time when sizing these pieces. You want a good friction fit. This is the piece that really holds the pattern all together. So you can see here I left this piece way too long. So I actually went back to the handsaw, shortened up the pieces a little bit, and that will save a little bit of planing time. So that's it. Once those pieces have been planed to length, it's ready for the final assembly. And if you want to hold the piece together permanently, I like to use a toothpick and just good old-fashioned yellow glue. And I just take a tiny little dot on the end of the toothpick and put it on each of the joints, slide the piece in place, and then clean up any squeeze out. After the piece is all assembled, if there's any misalignment in the height of the various pieces, it's easy to take your hand plane with a fine shaving and even that up a little bit. Or you can just rub the piece on some sandpaper or use a sanding block and that'll help even it up, make it look perfect. If you've made it this far in the video, I really appreciate your viewership. And it probably also means that you're going to give this a try. And I'd ask a favor of you, and that is, if you do give this a try, let me know how it turns out. I'd be interested to know if my method works for other people, and, and also if you'd have any suggestions for improvement. One final thing to note, this pattern is known as Asa no Ha, and it's also important to note that there are a couple different versions of the Asa no Ha pattern. Here's a still shot of a lamp I made a little while back. I believe the Japanese call these Andon. And if there's enough interest, I'd be happy to put together a build video. One final random shot of some other Kumiko I've worked on. Till next time, thanks for watching.